Hello, it's me, Johanna, and I'm back here today to do 5.6 Research and Development. This is only for higher level students. So again, I do not have any credentials. I just read the books and listen to my teacher. That's pretty much it. So let's get right into it. So what is research and development? That feels a little bit ridiculous to say because I think we all understand what research and development is. But um, just to give some more context to it, it's a form of innovation directly associated with the technical development of existing products or processes or the creation of new ones. But yeah, essentially you're just researching and developing products. So I think that should be pretty self-explanatory. So what are the advantages of research and development? Well, it gives the business a competitive advantage or it can give the business a competitive advantage. It can extend the life of an existing product. So now you can think back to when we did the product life cycle. It's sort of referring to that. So if you're talking about a test and they ask you about this, then you can refer to a model and it will make you just sound a lot smarter. You can open up to new markets because if you research them, you'll know that they might want your products. You can enhance the prestige of a company. Basically, you can improve their reputation because you can say like, oh, I'm a, a known innovator um, and that you make new things and that you're like the first on the market and, you know, stuff like that. And if you're known sort of for being like the best and the, well, not necessarily the best, but the first person to do stuff then usually you're able to create, you know, brand loyalty and stuff like that. You can motivate your workforce because you're designing new products and you're doing like cutting edge things. And if your workforce likes that and is like sort of bored of doing the same old thing, then it obviously can be motivating. You might improve the quality of either the product or the process. You might also reduce costs if you start thinking in a new way. For instance, if you improve your process, you could turn it into the lean um, method, which we discussed in an earlier video that will be linked at the end of this video in a playlist that has all of my business management videos I have made so far. And that would obviously reduce costs. But, however, there are some disadvantages. So first of all, opportunity costs. Um, what are the other things that the money could be spent on? You're choosing not to spend your money on research and development, but maybe instead you should be spending it on, <sighs> I can't think of anything, but you know, like maybe you should give people higher salaries. I don't know, whatever the case may be. Your research may, or and development may be going in a, the wrong direction. So for instance, if you develop your product, maybe the market no longer wants that product because you've changed it so much. It is very time consuming and obviously you have people, not people, sorry, employees who are working to research and stuff like that and they might be researching for years and that might be like a waste of space or like waste of time for that employee when they could have been doing something else. Um, it is fiercely competitive. So this obviously means if you're working on something that someone else is like also trying to figure out that you're going to try and compete to be like the first one to release those new stuff. And it's always sort of going to be that if someone releases it slightly before you or something like that, then you're screwed. You know what I mean? Because then you're no longer, you no longer have the advantage. Basically, this has to do with the fact that it's time consuming, but um, it can become bureaucratic and non-productive. Remember, bureaucratic is like a lot of paperwork and like da-da-da-da-da. Um, this is very common within, like, let's say drugs, like if you're a company that makes drugs, not like, I mean like medical drugs, because um, then it takes so, so, so long for them to actually use it, and you have to test the drugs to make sure they're not dangerous, and like da-da-da-da-da-da. So very quickly, it can become quite bureaucratic and even more time-consuming. There may be ethical issues involved. For instance, if you are doing research with like animals or humans, you might have some ethical things like let's say you're doing stem cells or you're modifying genes or crops or anything like that, then obviously there are ethical issues to think about. 
So marketing aspects of R&D. So something really important to mention here is intellectual property rights. So essentially, you want to be the newest, you want to be innovative, you are trying your hardest to be the first on the market doing this thing. Therefore, you have to protect your idea when you make it, because otherwise other people will just copy you or do something, well, yeah, basically just copy you and make the same product. So then product, so then customers might choose anyone. But if you are the first and only person doing a certain thing, then obviously you are going to get way more of the market share. So um, there are patents, copyright, and trademarks. So patents are when you invent a product or production process, you should take out a patent to protect your idea. So basically you buy this and it basically says that nobody can follow the exact things you have written down here for the next so and so many years. Usually it's like 20 years, maybe more, maybe less, you know, it depends on what you buy. And once those years are over, you can obviously re-buy the patent if you want. That doesn't mean that people can't make similar things to you, it's more that they can't use the exact same specifications that you did. So if they wanted to make a product that was a knockoff, they would have to change it significantly enough so it's not breaking the law. And this obviously gives you the first mover advantage. Then there is copyright. So copyright is very similar to a patent. However, it's applied to written material and also um, other like artistic forms of media. So on YouTube, there is a lot of discussion about copyright, about copyrighted music, about copyrighted slogans, about, you know, all things like that. And obviously that happens like you... And uh, basically what you do here as well, it gets protected for a certain amount of time, maybe like 50 years, and then nobody else is allowed to copy your exact written work or your exact music for that amount of time, and if they do, you can sue them and stuff like that, so that's fun. Then there are trademarks. So trademarks are, you know, conventionally used for logos, slogans, designs, and phrases, so there are non-conventional trademarks, which are the qualities that are distinctive to the design. For example, like a label, like the exact color and match and shape of the letters, you know. And then there are advantages to using all three of these. So these advantages go for all three of these things. So you have first movers advantage. Nobody else is legally allowed to do the things you are doing. You can increase your profit margins. You can safeguard continuity of production, you know, you get to do the same thing over and over again, nobody else does. You can develop brand loyalty, because as I said, nobody else is doing what you do, so why would they go to any other business? You can financially benefit from creativity, innovation, and R&D, which honestly is the most important part. Why are you even doing R&D if you can't benefit? So let's talk about different forms of innovation or different types, whatever you want to call it. So there are four P's here. There is product, process, positioning, and paradigm. However, we should probably not call it the four P's because there are already so many P's in the marketing mix. So let's just call it the types of innovation. Hopefully you can remember. But if you need something to remember it by, just remember everything starts with a P. That might help you. So, product innovation. It is a type of innovation where new products are created or significant improvements are made to existing products. So, this, you can literally find an example of this like anywhere, anywhere. For instance, every new iPhone that is created is at least slightly improved. Okay, then there is process innovation. So, this is a type of innovation where some parts of the manufacturing or service delivery are improved. So, for example, they used to use just in case, which again, if you want to know what these things are, we discuss them in some old videos and you can check them out. They will be linked in the playlist that is at the end. So, they used to use just in time, now they use just in case. There you go, that's some innovation right there. Positioning innovation refers to the use or perception of a new product or a service. So um, this is essentially changing your, I guess, reputation. I mean, not really reputation, but changing which area of the market you are in. 
A good example that it comes from the book is that a company that used to sell this medical drink suddenly decided to reposition and rebrand to become an energy drink. And um, I assume they significantly increased profits or something. I mean, otherwise it wouldn't say here. But you see, that's a good example. You took a product you already have. You didn't change anything about the product itself. They didn't change the drink. They just marketed it in a new um sector, not sector, a new market. So paradigm innovation. This refers to an innovation that is so significant and so important that it may change the industry itself. In my brain, the first thing that pops up is Tesla. So the way we think about electronic cars and environmentally friendly cars has completely changed because of what they have done in that business. So essentially, this is any type of innovation that is like so extreme that everybody else follows suit. Like all the other companies are like, what the hell are we doing? This is the right way. And those are the four different types of innovation. Then we get to forms of creativity. So you need creativity to have innovation, just so you're aware of that. I mean, obviously, I think we all know what creativity is. So there's adaptive creativity, and then there's innovative creativity. So adaptive creativity is a form of creativity that transfers and applies existing forms of thinking and problem solving to new scenarios, you know, new situations. Um, innovative creativity is a form of creativity that generates new forms of thinking, addressing problems from an unusual perspective, you know, stuff like that. So essentially, you're thinking in the box for adaptive, you're thinking outside of the box for innovative. That doesn't mean you're not being creative. Obviously, both of these, you're being creative, and both of them are good. None of them are better to the other. Like, you need both of them to have a business that is truly innovative. Because sometimes you need to, like, change things that are just, you know, in the same range of what you were already doing. You just need to change it a little bit. Meanwhile, other times you need to completely innovate and create new things. So both types of creativity are needed. So factors that can affect R&D. So if you look at organizational cultures, past experiences, and the change of pace. I'm sorry, I mean the pace of change. These are all sort of related because if you're in an industry that is not used to change or you have a track record of not being innovative or your organizational culture is very um, autocratic and you are just sort of told to follow orders, then you're not going to be likely to foster a very innovative and creative environment where people will feel like that is something they can do. Then there is uh, more like, you know, literal things like technology, finance, HR, legal constraints, and ethical concerns. So technology, obviously, if you don't have that much technology and someone else has way more technology than you, they're probably going to make more innovation or like more innovative ideas than you are because they just have the resources to do so. Same comes to finance. If you don't have that much finance available, oh, I dropped something, and someone else does, then obviously they have the upper hand. And, you know, HR is tied to the accountability of finance, and obviously they have to decide how much money to use where. Legal constraints, obviously some countries might it might be illegal to do certain things or like certain amounts of innovation. I don't know. It might be seen as like not allowed. For instance, if you're talking about airlines, then you're going to have to look at some legal things there. And, you know, it varies from country to country. Then there are ethical concerns. For instance, again, if you're doing something with like human or animal testing or like modifying genes then obviously what you're doing might be just not ethical and you have to think about it to make sure it is so that was it for today thank you so much for listening and watching and i hope you learned something feel free to subscribe to like to comment this week i will be posting extra many videos um because as a little like Thank you for 100 subscribers, but also because I have a break and I need to study for mocks, so it all works together. You can follow me at Johanna Frenert on Instagram if you want to. 
or MasterChef Jojo or any other Instagram account I have because for some reason I have like millions. Um, I really hope you learned something. Goodbye!